2020 was a strange year. When I think back to that time, I don't remember being locked indoors or working from home opposite my girlfriend at our kitchen table. I remember getting my brand new Series X and playing Cyberpunk 2077. I was the only human in existence who liked Cyberpunk on launch. The Series X version was actually playable, and through the murky, buggy water, I saw a game with the potential to be great. I saw some of the best characters that we have in gaming, and a world that was unlike anything we'd seen before. A world that if padded out and fixed, could be something special. But maybe in hindsight, I was a little too generous, because now I see fundamental issues with Cyberpunk, outside of its technical performance. Its RPG systems, while great in some areas, fail in some of the most basic. Its gameplay loop is satisfying, but needs more to keep us hooked, and the storytelling goes from great to laughable in one hour to the next. Because for everything CD Projekt Red does good, they equally do bad. But I'd argue that this is true for the majority of open world games. Halo Infinite has a bland open world, and the main missions basically repeat themselves but we love Halo Infinite because the gunplay and encounters are incredible. And we don't love Horizon Zero Dawn because of its map marker collectathon or repetitive side quests. We love Horizon because the open world is stunning and we fight robot dinosaurs. But my point is that most games have parts that are great and parts that are not. And Cyberpunk 2077 is exactly the same because when it's good, it's very good indeed. Rock, you! Don't do this! The Scorpion. The biggest problem when Cyberpunk launched was its open world. The open world failed to meet the most basic quality bar that we expect from any game. The list of issues was vast and included things like stilted NPCs or the lack of the simplest mechanics like a working wanted level. Well, the good news is that the open world is much better. Walking around Night City is like walking around a real place. We have high numbers of pedestrians in the busiest areas, and people generally going about their day. I've actually played a lot of open world city games recently, and I saw features in Cyberpunk that have impressed me in other games, as well as features that I'd never seen before. On the most basic level, we have pedestrians that act like real people. We'll often see someone walking down the street with a different animation, someone carrying an item or holding an umbrella when it's raining. This is great, but we can't praise it too much as other games have been doing this since the 360 and PS3 days. However, we can praise Cyberpunk for the things it does on top of this, like a group of people partying under a freeway, or a homeless person scavenging through a bin looking for food, or even these two people metal detecting on a beach who end up arguing with each other. Did you find anything? Yeah, crowbar, rusted through, and if you don't shut your mouth, it's going right up your ass. These interactions between the people of Night City help pad out the world. By simply stopping to eavesdrop on a conversation, we're learning more about life in this fictional place. We hear a group of cops discussing a cyber psycho attack, or someone singing the words to a famous Night City musical. A lot of this has been added for the next gen updates, with new interactions everywhere. And again, some of these are really impressive. Putting our laughter, our tears on full display! Like in that show! Quick, get next to him! I'll snap his still if you are arresting him for revealing government secrets. Open your mind before it is too late! Jessica will like die when she sees this. Because of features like this, it's hard not to be engrossed by this world. There is so much to see that it always feels like we're being bombarded by something new. So many times I would stop to take in the visuals on screen, whether it was the intense glow of a neon sign, or the many overlapping structures of this world. Even the simplest of structures are redesigned to create something special, like staircases lined with neon, or concrete pillars with bright lights. It's really, really impressive, and we can't understate how great this is. I mean, look at this here. There's so many different layers and details around us. It's so dense that we have no idea where we are most of the time. There are tunnels created by massive skyscrapers, and even levels hidden beneath the city. It's the most intricate map I've seen since Metroid Dread, with so many interweaving routes that connect in mind-bending ways. And I know that The Ascent also has a map that is visually stunning, and arguably denser than Night City. 
but there's just something about exploring the world in first person and seeing the scale of everything up close that takes it to the next level. Unfortunately though, there are still issues with the open world. Even though we have great actions for pedestrians, Night City can still feel stilted. A lot of the great conversations repeat themselves, where we'll see the same people having the same conversation over and over. Or when people have finished speaking, they just stand there like a theme park animatronic who's just powered down. We do occasionally see people walk off and carry on with their day, but it's not used frequently enough to keep us immersed. There are bigger issues though, due to how the open world has been designed. It's surprising that for an open world of this size, we can't interact with it as much as we'd like. We have marketplaces where we can't buy anything from vendors, and we're lacking something to break up the pace of the main gameplay loop. Something like gambling in a casino, or playing an arcade machine, or even a card game like Gwent. But unfortunately, we don't have any of that in Cyberpunk. It's a missed opportunity, as there are actual arcade machines in the game, with games that look incredible. We even have one in our north side apartment, but it just sits there and we can't play on it. I guess you could argue that this isn't essential, and maybe we should criticise the game for what it does, rather than what it doesn't, which is a fair point. But even with this in mind, we still have issues. We have issues with features that are in the game, but they're underbaked and delivered poorly. When we hold up our gun in a public place, for example, people now run away in fear, but then this mechanic still isn't perfect as it's far too sensitive. The second we aim down sights, everyone within half a mile shits themselves and runs off. It's great that some NPCs stand their ground and fight back, but because of how sensitive this feature is, it's just not realistic. And again, it's a similar story with the cops. The cops are much better now and no longer spawn behind us when we break the law. But then the issue here is that nobody chases after us if we drive off. At higher wanted levels, turrets do drop down from buildings, which is a great idea, but most of the time, we just hop in a car and drive out of the area. It's so frustrating, because I want to sit here and sing Cyberpunk's praises. The cops alone have so many open world scenarios. They get into shootouts with gangs and chase suspects through the city, but we just need slightly more work in the areas that matter, the core mechanics, rather than the open world dressing. I really don't want to talk about this next section, because we're all bored of the cyberpunk bashing by now, but unfortunately, I have to. Even after version 1.5 and version 1.52, there are still bugs and technical issues. I played on the Series X, so note that the PS5 and PC versions may be better. The most common bugs I saw, though, were items floating in mid-air, or alternatively sunk into the ground, which isn't a massive deal to me personally. But there are things that are big deals, things that break immersion in the open world. I'd often see an NPC playing an arcade machine that wasn't turned on, or after I'd knock a fire hydrant over, water would magically phase through my car. This really isn't acceptable, as GTA 4 had more realism in 2008. There were also times that enemies phased through objects, or when characters moved in strange ways. The worst example of this was when River was stuck in crouch mode after an encounter but the top half of his body moved independently from his bottom. Or during the beat on the Brat mission, when Caesar's body was vibrating at random. I couldn't speak to him to progress the mission, so I fast travelled and came back. It didn't fix anything, as when I returned, he looked like this. And the amount of popping was a persistent issue. It was worse when driving around, with constant popping in the distance, as the game struggled to load. It's a shame CDPR recently announced they're moving to Unreal 5, because they've created a stunning looking game in their Red Engine that they've developed over many years. But if it means that The Witcher 4 isn't a buggy mess, I'm sure we can all agree that is a positive move. Hey, hey, we're chill! Alright, let's do this. The basic premise in Cyberpunk 2077 is that we have the engram of Johnny Silverhand implanted in our brain. He's overwriting our consciousness until one day we will be gone forever. So, our story takes us through the many interesting locations of Night City as we find a way to remove Johnny and save ourselves. I actually don't think this main plot point is that interesting, as all we do is go around finding the people who can help us. But even though I don't think it's that interesting, I still think the narrative is great, because it's how these points are used that make it special. We jump back and forth between past and present to witness key moments in Johnny's life, and we also visit interesting locations in modern day Night City. Cloud's nightclub, where we see vulnerable people being exploited, or into the deserts of the Badlands to examine how people live outside city limits. 
There are so many standout moments like this that the narrative stays in our minds long after the credits roll. Arguably, this is spectacle over substance, but I was always happy to be along for the ride. I mean, it is genuinely hard not to get excited when the soundtrack kicks in. Even after 17 months, Johnny's theme is still a tune. All world loves me. Johnny is the real highlight of the narrative, the way he's always with us, acting like a devil on our shoulder. He's basically like a well-developed RPG companion, who we get to know after many hours. We completely understand his motives and why he turned out the way he did. We learn about his backstory and understand how events in his life created the person we see today. Plus, there's some decent banter thrown in there for good measure. Little something called intuition, V. Ever heard of it? Oh, so what you meant to say was, you're full of shit. Got it. It's in moments like this that Cyberpunk dips its toe into greatness, with some of the sharpest writing that made The Witcher 3 special. But then it's frustrating because there are moments where I cringe at the events on screen. Johnny, for example, is a good character, but he has so many lines of dialogue that sound like they were written by a teenager. A teenager trying to be edgy, who thinks this is how adults speak. Boy, know what? You're starting to remind me of me. 50 years back, minus the charisma, an impressive cock. And I wish I could say that this was it, but the writing dips in quality across the board. There are some incredible moments that are genuinely thought-provoking and poetic. A new face of Arasaka, same old shit, different packaging. Back to back with others that are so bad, I laughed out loud. The fuck kind of droid toy are you supposed to be? Fucking ghost off! We also have to talk about the RPG mechanics used in the main missions. And this is what I meant when I said Cyberpunk fails to meet the basic requirements of an RPG. Because rather than having the freedom to tackle a mission in any way we want, most of our choices end at the same point. Even the most basic of RPG mechanics, like bartering on the price of something, isn't here. We always have to pay. This is bad for any RPG, as it takes away player choice. But the problem runs much deeper than this, as it ruins a lot of great moments. Moments that are robbed of any tension. I said in my original review that the main missions had a Tarantino-like suspense, where we know there's a bomb under the table, but we don't know when it's going to explode. And while I think that is still true for the big set-piece moments, I don't think it's true in the smaller moments. Take this section with Placid, for example. This moment should be tense, as Placide really doesn't like us. There could have been interesting options for us to choose in this conversation, with each option changing how Placide treats us. But because we have so little control over the events on screen, this moment falls flat. We do have skill checks, which is a nice touch, including many tied to our life path. But the problem is, they don't go anywhere, they're all superficial. These skill checks should have been implemented like an actual RPG, like in Disco Elysium, when we fail a skill check, the option is locked off from us, sometimes forever. So every time we try a skill check in Disco Elysium, we literally roll the dice and pray the RPG gods are looking down on us. This makes every skill check extremely tense, as we could be one bad roll away from game over. But unfortunately, we don't have this in Cyberpunk. Even in Cyberpunk's greatest RPG moments, we don't go far enough. At the end of certain missions, we do get to side with a faction, and this changes how the mission plays out. If we side with the Voodoo Boys, for example, we don't have to fight Placide at the end of the mission, we just walk away. And before this, if we side with the Maelstrom in another mission, they become our allies and fight by our side. What's great about that last choice is that we see this play out later in the game, when we're welcomed into a Maelstrom club with open arms. But because we're missing key RPG features, none of this makes sense. When the Maelstrom are our allies, they don't mind that we've spent the rest of the game murdering their gang members, or when we win over the trust of the animals and can access their gym whenever we want, we return to the same gym in a gig and straight up murder everyone inside. There's no consequences to any of these actions. I know that if you've played Cyberpunk, you're probably sitting there thinking, this random British guy is cherry picking examples and not being representative of the actual game. And that is true. There are great RPG moments in Cyberpunk, moments that I really enjoyed, but they are always hidden away in the side jobs. Why weren't they used in the places that matter? 
Thankfully, we do have great RPG choices in the core gameplay. We have loads of different ways to play that are all based on our build. Sure, we can go in all guns blazing if we have an assault build, but we also have options to tackle an encounter in different ways. We can sneak in through a back door or through a hole in a fence, or we can jump onto the roof and enter through a skylight. And these options are tied to our skills, power to rip open doors like the Hulk, or technical to open new routes through a level. I went for a stealth build this time, and I was really impressed with the amount of options available to us. We have all of the basic mechanics that stealth games need, like takedowns and hiding bodies, but we also have ways to expand our moveset with meaningful loot and interesting perks. We can use a reboot optics quick hack to temporarily blind an enemy, setting them up for an easy takedown, or we can wipe their memory if they spot us. It's really cool, as we're rewarded for planning our build with new abilities in-game. This was by far the strongest part of Cyberpunk's gameplay, the complexity in planning a build. For example, for my stealth build, I focused on the ninjutsu skill tree, which had a perk so I could throw any knife I was holding. What I really liked about this was how there were more perks that tied into this ninja role, like the addition of poison damage for each knife. And we have loads of interweaving perks scattered across multiple skill trees. Of course though, not every perk is this good, some perks only give us incremental damage boosts. These perks are handy for certain builds, but they're just not that exciting. I mean, would you rather have a 5% increase to headshot damage, or run around the arena like a ninja chaining knife headshots together? All of this is really fun. Can we say that? Cyberpunk is a fun game, we have weapons that are fun to shoot, and even the melee combat is great. And I know that this is a very basic form of critique, but it is important to me. One of the reasons that Returnal was my favourite game of last year was because of how good it felt to play. The way we move through an arena, how it feels to shoot, and how the dual sense took everything to the next level. Sure, we could always have more interesting weapons like laser beams or over-the-top weapons like in Doom Eternal, but I thought that CDPR got the balance between sci-fi and realism just right. It's interesting because the combat was one of the biggest criticisms on launch. This was mainly due to the enemy AI, who would stand out in the open waiting to be shot. I just want to highlight that this still does happen. On lower difficulties, you can still play like the Terminator, by ripping turrets off their sockets and stomping through an arena. And I would say that the hip fire is too generous. You can basically fire from the hip and bullets home in on people's heads, even across an arena, which is a bit of a joke. But overall, everything is much better. The enemy AI, for example, is more intelligent. Enemies now charge forwards to put us in uncomfortable positions, or they'll fall back if they're taking damage. You can see that clearly here, that when I shoot this enemy, he retreats to find cover and create distance between us. A lot of these upgrades help create organic moments in combat that keeps the gameplay interesting. Groups of enemies now split up and try to flank us, or they drop their weapon if we shoot their hand, only to quickly equip another weapon and carry on fighting. I mean, I'll never forget the moment that an enemy shot an explosive barrel blowing themselves up, which is dumb, but I'm sure we're all guilty of a few misplaced shots here and there. We also have to praise CDPR for the depth of rewards in Cyberpunk. Every time we beat an encounter, or after we've ticked off a piece of content, there's a perk point or some powerful loot waiting around the next corner. After the next-gen update, there are more things to spend our money on too. Cars that look incredible and actually handle properly now, and brand new items like apartments. I was genuinely surprised at how good the apartments were. They're all worth buying, each with a different theme depending on the district they're in. Like the apartment in Japantown, which has some incense we can burn. The fact that we can interact with items inside each apartment is a staple of other open world city games, but I liked how Cyberpunk added its own twist. Because Cyberpunk is an RPG, these interactions give us temporary perks. Sleeping gives us an XP boost, while showering provides health regen and coffee boosts our stamina. I love life simulator mechanics like this. There gets a point in the game though, when all of these gameplay hooks fall off. About halfway through the game, we've basically developed our build. We have all of the perks we want and there's nothing left to spend our money on. We might have all the cars we want and all of the apartments across Night City. And it's within these moments that Cyberpunk starts to peter out. The reason for this isn't because the gameplay is bad. I've just described how good and how addictive it can be. Rather, I think the issue comes with the lack of gameplay variety. If we look at the open world activities, they are essentially the same. The NCPD jobs are mini encounters with a small group of enemies, whereas the gigs are like bandit camps we find in other games. 
Early on, these activities are great. The NCPD jobs give us that quick burst of action, and the gigs push us into locations we'd never normally go. Deep into the heart of each district, to seedy clubs, bars, rundown apartment blocks and everything in between. The gigs are also a great example of Cyberpunk's RPG mechanics, as we use our skills to coerce people into helping us. So, the problem isn't the activities themselves, it's due to how often we're pushed into combat, simply because of how many there are. Seriously, guess how many gigs there are in Cyberpunk? I'll wait a second. Ready? In Cyberpunk 2077, there are 86 gigs. There's 22 in Watson alone, which took me about 5 hours to beat. I mean, compare this to Halo Infinite, which has 7 banished outposts and 15 high value targets. I enjoyed ticking off every one of these activities, so when I finished Halo Infinite I wanted more, but after finishing Cyberpunk, I am completely burnt out. Okay, so I've been pretty critical of Cyberpunk so far, so now I want to explain why, even with all of these issues, I still think the game is great. I've seen people jokingly say that Cyberpunk officially starts when we reach the final mission. At this point, Act 3 begins and all of the interesting side jobs open up. Well, I completely agree. The first thing to say is that the side jobs create an incredible sense of wonder. Usually, they're shown on the map as undiscovered markers, where we head over to each one to start the mission. But because each side job is completely different, it makes it impossible to guess what's in store. It could be a wacky mission, where someone has a malfunctioning implant in an unfortunate place. Whereas the next mission could be heartfelt and genuinely moving, like helping a grieving cop come to terms with the bereavement in his family. They're not all perfect, and I think we have a contender for the worst chase section in gaming history, but I always prefer developers to create more variety and sometimes fail, than give us the same missions over and over. The side jobs also give us actual player choice, where we're in the centre of a conflict and we decide how it should turn out. There are throwaway moments where we'll wander somewhere, say a few lines and the mission is complete, but there are also missions where we have a stake in the future of Night City. One side job, for example, takes us back to Clouds from the main narrative, where we overthrow its corrupt owners and decide who should take their place. This is what makes RPGs great, that feeling that we have control over the world, that we can shape it in any way we see fit. I know that Cyberpunk doesn't deliver wholly on this front, as these actions never play out in the world, but when you're in the moment, that is what it feels like. It's always impactful because we're given a choice, even if the choice isn't perfectly executed. But the main reason I think the side jobs propel Cyberpunk into greatness is because of the characters. The missions with each character are like a Love, Death and Robots anthology set in Night City. We'll often go from extremely dark, where we rescue River's nephew from a haunting serial killer, to comical, where we head backstage in a club to intimidate a Japanese pop band. These missions also stand out as brand new mechanics are developed, like a drivable tank in the Badlands, or an underwater mission where we dive to an abandoned town. These side jobs understand what makes Cyberpunk great, being in Night City and immersed in the moment. It's not the over-the-top writing or the bombastic set pieces, it's the slower moments, kicking back, grabbing food and talking with each character. All of this is handled with such grace and maturity that they might as well have been made by different people. It's hard to imagine the over-the-top moments in the main narrative in the same universe as these side jobs. It's hard to imagine that these two Johnnies are the same people. I'm going to talk about the characters in depth now, so if you want to avoid spoilers, skip ahead to my final thoughts. The characters in Cyberpunk are some of the best we have in gaming. Each one of these characters are completely human, with multi-layered personalities and depth. Take Judy for example. Judy is a strong character. She's basically the badass archetype that we see in other games. But rather than CDPR using the typical cliches, like over-the-top lines or murdering someone at random, all of her development is delivered in a subtle way. We know who she is simply by the way she acts. Like here, when I'm trying to thank her after a mission. Rather than replying with a generic line we've heard a thousand times before, she simply blanks me and carries on with her day. I know what I'm doing. As we get to know Judy, we see more parts of her personality. We learn that she finds it hard to be nice, as she awkwardly looks to the floor after thanking us. And we learn about her interests when we visit her apartment. 
We can interact with different objects, which shows us her hobbies, which is a great start. But we also see subtle clues hidden away. We see sea creatures painted on her wall, which only makes sense in hindsight, because later in the game, we learn Judy is into scuba diving and has decorated her apartment to reflect this hobby. This is how you write characters, because a character isn't just what they say or how they act, it's how they live their lives. How they put their personality on the world in the subtlest of ways, just like decorating an apartment. This level of quality is the same for other characters. Every character is three-dimensional. Takemura is an Arasaka bodyguard who grew up in the slums of Chiba 11. But he's also someone who's into food. He often complains about the quality of food in Night City and even texts us to ask about decent food spots. Or Johnny's old bandmate Kerry, who's struggling with life after fame. When we meet Kerry, he's suicidal and his apartment is lined with empty booze bottles. But over time, we help him reconnect with his old friends and eventually find new ones. And finally, Panam is someone whose tough exterior is to hide her fears of being hurt. She left her clan searching for a better life, only to realize that life is only great when it's shared with the people you love. All of these moments are full of heart, where we bond with these fictional people like close friends. The moment when we say goodbye to Judy genuinely moved me. After the mission was over, I stood there for five minutes, in silence, stunned. This is why I think cyberpunk is great, because these moments made me feel something in the same way my favourite films or albums do. That feeling in our stomach, or when the hairs on the back of our necks stand up. That feeling that only comes when we experience something extraordinary. So yes, cyberpunk still isn't perfect, and it still isn't the game we were promised. But in its greatest moments, the neon of Night City shines through to create something special. An open world that is the densest we've seen, some great RPG gameplay in its character builds and side missions, and the side missions with its cast of human characters. One way or another, this is a game that will go down in history. I just hope that now, it's finally for the right reasons.